Hello, hello, and welcome to Lawrence Plays, and it's time for some more Factorio Space Exploration with Crastorio 2, where I'm going to run through a bit of an update on everything that went on in the last stream. I'm afraid this video is going to be a bit spoiler-heavy, should we say. I'm not going to be delving into any of the uh, complicated and deep and meaningful stuff to do with the, uh, the endgame puzzle, however I do touch on it a little bit towards the end, and also the first part of it is going to be talking about um, the Arcolink storage chests and how they work. So, not any major spoilers, but if, you, if, you're, uh, if you're really trying to avoid any anything remotely spoilery about this game then I will understand if you don't want to watch this video and hopefully we'll see you tomorrow where the video will be much more spoiler free. To be honest there's nothing in here that's enormously complex so I don't think it really counts as a, that much of a spoiler. And starting from the very beginning, well, I told you um, a couple of weeks ago, I think now, maybe th maybe three weeks ago, because I had a week off, um, that I, I, I came in and I put in this machine up at the top here that's bringing in nearly all the bits and pieces that are required to make the Arcolink storage devices. So we've got the dyna dynamic emitters being brought in here, and along with the Nequian processors, we've got, we've got nanomaterials coming in along the belt here, we've got heavy assemblies along here, and so on and so on, all the way around. The one thing we haven't got being brought over, either by belts or by bots, is these Lambda Arcospheres. And that's because Arcospheres are expensive and valuable and we've only made 250 of them in total and over the over the entirety of it whenever because well you don't actually make them as such you go out and discover them and so they're a bit more uh, a bit harder to get hold of anyway we'll, we'll, we've talked about that plenty in the past but the point being that we're, the, we're bringing these ones over by hand and feeding them directly into the machine and so Mike did exactly that. He went over to the Arcosphere area, which is over here somewhere in the, at the top of the science, and he stole 20 uh, Lambda Arcospheres out of the top of this chest, brought them over, and fed them into this machine so we can make two of the Arcolink storage devices. And once you've made some Arcolink storage chests, the next question is, how do you use them? So they're, they're an item. You can put them down like this, and boom, they appear just like that. And when you place one, you'll see that there's a nice swirly effect in them, and that seems to change colour depending on, um, on, on the number on it. And yes, there is also a number, and that refers first to the surface you put it down on. So if I put down another one, then it will appear with another 26. So we there, there will always, if I place them on Talos, because I'm on Talos at the moment, if I place down an Arcolink chest, then it will always appear with the 26 on it. And that, and that means anything I put in one chest, so if I put these, if I put those in there, those underground belts in there, they will immediately be available in both of them, because these two chests share an inventory. So if I take them out of there, then they disappear from this one. I can repeat this as much as I want. If I put something in there, it appears in that one. If I take it out of there, it disappears from that one. It is a shared inventory. However, if you place an Arcolink chest on a different surface, then it will have a different number on it. So if I fly over and go up the uh, space elevator, and then place down one of my Arcolink chests up here, you can see this time, now it's got a 30 on it, and it's got, it, instead of the, uh, the brown colour, or ready brownie colour it had before, now it has a fetching blue colour. And that means if I put something in here, like for example these three core mining drills, and head back down again, and then put another Arcolink chest down on the ground like that. You see, that's a number 26 again. And if I look in here, none of that's none of those drills are there, so I can't get at them. And so that means there's a little bit of a puzzle here because the whole point of these things is they, they're fantastic for teleporting things from one place to another. Now, on a planet, you don't really need a teleporter because you have trains, so it's much easier to send stuff around by train rather than spend huge quantities of, Ar of Arcospheres on making these chests to teleport stuff around. So they're not so great. If you if you put if you just put them down like this, then yeah, okay, sure, I can put something in here like that, and then if I fly back over to the other one I put down earlier, and have a look in these, yeah, you can see there are those speed modules. So they've been teleported, they're effectively, if I take them out again, they've been teleported across. And that's great, but yeah, as I say, on a planet, it's not really that useful, because you've got trains, you've got many other ways of getting things around. It would probably be cheaper to run a belt from one side of the planet than it would be to, uh, to, use, to use the Arcolink chests. Where they really come into their own, the whole point of these things is teleporting things around from one planet to another. But... If you go out to another planet and you place down your Arcolink chest and then go to a different one, place down another one over there, then they won't be linked. So you have to find a way to get around that. And the answer I came up with for this is not, it's not exactly complicated, but the answer I came up with was you place two of them down, but you put them on a spaceship in a specific surface, doesn't matter where the surface is. And then you fly the spaceship from one surface to another surface, and those Arcolink chests will still be linked even after they've been moved over. And so if you're, if you're clever about that, you can, you can go to one surface, you can deploy one, and you can fly to another surface and deploy another one, and they'll still be linked because you won't pick them up at any point. And so using that, well, I've, um, I've got a recording from the stream, so what I did was I, I, uh, I took my normal spaceship and I, I built this sort of um, torpedo thing on the side of it, which has an engine on the back and a, and a booster tank and a spaceship console and then a gap for an Arcolink chest. So I put the Arcolink chest in there and then because it had engines on it, I was able to detach it from my spaceship and then fly it over to the planet, land on the planet and deploy it. And then once I'd done that, I was able to pull up all of the spaceship parts from around it and just leave it sat there. So you'll notice that this Arcolink storage here is actually 
actually still sat, you can just about see around the edge of it, it is still sat on some spaceship flooring, which I, I can't pick up because there's something on top of it. And that one is a number 30, and you'll remember that's the same number as we saw up in space. And so this one has still got those mining drills in it, so I can, I can take them out if I want, or not worry about, not bother, it doesn't really matter. And the reason I did it like this, rather than landing my actual spaceship on Talos, is because Talos is a fairly big planet, and therefore it's got a strong gravity, it takes a lot of fuel to lift off from the planet, and I'm virtually certain that my spaceship is not capable of doing that. So I didn't want to, I didn't want to blast off from the planet like that, because it, it basically it wouldn't work, my spaceship would have been trapped down here. So I made this little landing pod that came down and could be just completely sacrificial. The other end of this, as you can see by all of these loaders around the edge of it that are tied to, uh, to Naquatite, the other end is supposed to be going out to another um, asteroid field. And if you have another look at my spaceship in the recording here, you can see there's another lump on the side of it that has an Arcolink chest in it that is also a number 30. And that one, I then I then flew that back to Norbit, landed over here in the middle of, basically in the middle of nowhere, and detached it from the side of my spaceship. So this is now sitting here, and it's ready and waiting for somebody else, and in this case, somebody else is going to be Mike, because he's setting up the next system, as I'll talk about in a moment. Um, he's then able to land his spaceship right next to it and then join it on with a piece of wall and then that will all count as one spaceship. He'll be able to fly this then over out to another asteroid field, detach it over there and then once again dismantle all the stuff from around the edge of it and then start using um, deep space loaders to start feeding in the Naquatite as fast as he possibly can. And so that will allow us then to teleport the Naquatite from the asteroid field over to Talos and we'll be able to get really high throughput because we'll be able to feed seven high speed belts in, seven high speed belts out. There'll be no latency and we'll and by flying the things around like this rather than by in, rather than putting them in our inventory, we've got round the rule that every time you deploy one, it's going to be locked to that surface because we've sneakily taken it from one surface to another. A minor side effect of this uh, thing where the, the Arcolynx chests are defined by the surface you put them down on is that it means you can't deploy one on a moving spaceship. So if a spaceship is already out and flying, you, the game literally won't let you put down a, an Arcolink chest on it because it doesn't have its own sort of permanent surface. It's just been, it's, the spaceships are sort of, they're a, they're a funny edge case in, in uh, space exploration. They're not a, a proper surface. So you can't build an Arcolink chest on one. However, if you've built it on a spaceship that's in an orbit around a planet, then it's absolutely fine and you can take it to wherever you want. So with 30 being Talos orbit, we can take this away. And if we, in the future, if we want to put out and down any more of these, we could put down additional um, Arcolink chests in Tal orbit and then take them off to somewhere else. And they would all be, and they would all link together. So we'd have, then we'd have three of them sharing an inventory or four or five or however many we ended up making. And so this then brings us on to the whole point of doing all of this. So we've discovered that we have, we basically, we've got to the point where we, uh, we're trying to use the Naquim faster than we're uh, digging it up out on in Stardust. So as you may remember from beforehand, we've got the trains, we've got a spaceship, we've got actually we've got lots of spaceships bringing it over from Stardust, uh, unloading the Naquitite there. It gets brought down here into this into this warehouse, and then from here we can unload it into uh, into this system here. And this one, this is being run by a purple belt, and that means that this purple belt output, as I've said a number of times before, is run running at the same speed as our entire logistics system are feeding it in over on Stardust. Stardust has eight belts, because there's two of these systems, of, um, of Naquatite coming out and being and being pulverised, therefore it has, uh, because that then quarters the amount, you get one uh, crushed out for every one actual Naquatite you put in, you've then essentially got two belts of um, crushed Naquatite coming into this uh, warehouse over here, when the system is running absolutely flat out. Now at the moment it's not running as fast as it could, so we've got, we've got other problems elsewhere, but once we sort out those problems, once we get the system running properly, we will have essentially one purple belt's worth of uh, Naquatite being brought in and being loaded into the spaceships and then in, so so we can't actually unload it at the other end any faster than one purple belt without eventually running out. Now as I say this system is not running at the moment for reasons I'll get into later but at the moment it's not able to keep up. So because we've had various other failures and therefore we've built up quite a large backlog last time I decided to be sensible to build another Naquim processing facility over here. So this one is also taking out a solid purple belt's worth of um, crushed Naquatite and that means we've got one belt going into the the entire logistics system from out in Stardust and then we've got two belts worth coming back out again and that as you can imagine is not going to be sustainable in the long run we're going to have some problems there now in the short term it's, it's okay because we've, we've got um, a, we've got a huge backlog here in the warehouse we've got some in the train we've got loads in orbit loads in this spaceship up here and then we've got several spaceships all queued up along here waiting to park waiting to land in Talos orbit and start unloading all of the crushed Naquatite they've got so it's going to take quite a long time for us to actually see a problem but eventually, having two belts coming out of here and only one belt's worth going in is going to become a problem. 
And so in order to speed that up, we need to have an additional feed of Naquitite. Now one possibility would be to put in more processing on Stardust, so we can have it coming through four times as fast. We could get a bit more through that way and just make everything run faster. However, out in Stardust, I've tapped all the good Naquitite patches out here. Uh, we, and when, it, when the system is actually running flat out, it's, it is able to keep up, but only just. And so I don't really want to go even, 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 even further out. And also, we'd then need more spaceships, we need more, uh, and so and, and all the infrastructure is just getting, it's just getting a little bit heavy, I guess is perhaps a good word. We've got we've got two, so many trains, so many spaceships, so just so much, it's all a bit complicated. And also, we've got the Arcolink chests that we've never played with, and so it seemed like a good idea to try those out. And so, on Talos, we're going to be unloading all of the Naquitite here. It's going to be coming out of all of these belts once we have a, have a supply of it. And it can then, from there, it can flow out and it can go into all of these machines along here, which are then going to pulverise it down from being the, uh, the, the Naquitite into the crushed Naquitite. And we've seen this happening before out in Stardust, but the other advantage of doing it here is it means I can eventually, if we ha when we have some, I can put productivity modules into all of these machines and we'll be able to get a lot more, well, we'll be able to get a bit more Naqu Naquitite out, and therefore we'll get more Naquium out for each Naquitite we mine. And given the effort and price of Naquium, that seems like quite a good thing to do. I also find it quite amusing that I've got purple belts feeding in along all these systems, and then uh, red belts coming back out again because the speed is, is so much slower. Granted, it's also because one purple belt is feeding two banks of machines and we've got two red belts coming out there. So, okay, it's two red belts coming out and one purple belt coming in, but that difference there is, I, I do find that quite entertaining. And we can then have a flood of all the Naquium uh, products coming out, out down here. Now, this is a little bit more complicated than just, just pulverizing it with some of the other things. And we've seen this before over in Stardust, but we'll take another quick look at it. Because over here, if you look at this recipe, you can see we require iridium plate in order to run at all, and so I've got a, a supply of iridium. I'm going to have a supply of iridium ingots being brought in by the same system that's bringing all the other stuff for Naquium processing coming in. Now that's going to cause some a, a few overload issues, but never mind. I've, I've got enough space on this warehouse that I can bring out a belt here with the uh, with the iridium on it. That's brought over to here. This assembly machine over here is eventually going to slice up those iridium ingots into iridium plates that can be fed in. So that's great. We'll have a supply of iridium plates coming in. We will then be feeding iridium plates back out again, along with all the other outputs. So I've got the uh, this filtra filtration system here that's going to take the iridium plates, put them back into the machine again, and the crushed aquatite can then be just passed on down this red belt over here. And I've done the standard trick over here where you load from the unlimited supply with an inserter, and from the overflow pass-through pass supply with a loader. Loaders are capable of loading machines up to a much higher level than inserters are, so that means that the, this one will essentially take priority. Any, um, any plates that come out of here will immediately go straight back in again. However, if this ever starts to run a, run out, then we'll load more up with the uh, with the inserter over here, and so we'll, be, we'll always be able to have enough available. We also produce uh, iridium powder and water out of here. So the iridium powder, because it's not iridium uh, plate, will also will then be passed down here. It will then be filtered out by this splitter and passed on to this blue belt along with the uh, the output from all of the other ones. We've got some funny shenanigans going on in here because these two are a little bit close together, so these belts are. Um, we're going to have a bit more on the top side of the belt than the bottom side, or the left side than the right side. Or should I say port and starboard? Um, we'll have more on the port side, uh, that'll, that'll, but that probably won't matter, because I don't expect us to have that much iridium powder coming out here. But that then gets passed over here. We can then cook it down along with, well, we need to bring in some enriched vulcanite, which can also come from th up through, uh, through the spaceship system. Uh, and that can be passed through into here, and we can load both of those into these centrifuges. They will then pass it through into here, where we can cook it in the furnace, we can cook it down back into iridium ingots. And we've got a feed of pyroflux coming in here as well and that's just coming out of the pyroflux supply that goes to the rest of the facility down here because we've already got lots of it and that's going to allow us to then make remake the uh, the iridium ingots here which can then be brought over to be chopped up over here and once again I've done the the inserter and the uh, loader system here to make sure that the ones coming out of here are prioritized over the ones that are coming from the uh, from the spaceship I got a bit lazy with the water that's just going to come down the pipes here and be sent straight into a flare stack to be blown off as mist into the atmosphere I don't care it's water it's cheap who cares? We'll just do. We'll just do that. It's, it'll, it'll be fine. The, 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 I don't see that as a serious problem. This whole system over here for recycling the iridium should look very, very familiar to you because it's exactly the same system I built up out on Stardust. So over here, we've got the crushed aquatite and the iridium powder coming along these belts here out of the uh, out of the uh, mechanical facilities because mechanical facilities are the space equivalent of a pulverizer. They're just painted a different color so that they work in space. They come along here and then we're filtering out the uh, the iridium powder and then bringing it down here to a uh, radiation facility, which is the space equivalent of a centrifuge. This one looks slightly more different, but never mind. And then being passed down into the thermodynamic facility, which is again the space equivalent of a furnace. 
So it's exactly the same system, but it's just using the space buildings along here. But for this one, it seems to be steam that comes out rather than water, um, perhaps, who knows why. Uh, so we're then condensing that down in a condenser turbine and returning it to the system, because water is a bit more valuable out in space, so we don't want to just blow it off in, into as, as a gas and, and forget about it. But other than that, it's essentially the same system running up here as, 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 we, as we have over on Talos, because it's doing the same job. We've even got the same, uh, same sort of banks of, uh, of inputs and outputs going on over here. Now there is one important step I've missed out here, and that is in order to mine Naquitite you require a supply of sulfuric acid, and you'll remember from previous videos that I spent a lot of time trying to get enough sulfur out to Stardust in order to produce enough acid to, in order to keep the systems full, keep these, these tanks over here full, to keep the trains running, to keep the Naquitite flowing in, and eventually I managed to get there. It required a lot of sulfur to be brought over, but it did work. Um, and so this means that the system we're setting up at the moment on Talos, well, wherever we go, wherever we start trying to produce our naquitite, we're going to need a supply of sulfuric acid as well. And so, uh, once again, we're going to use the fact that the Arcolink storage chests aren't a one-way system, they are a shared inventory. And that means we can feed in the ingredients required to make the sulfuric acid and send that through the Arcolink chest to the other end. And then over in the, in the asteroid field where we're building this, we can start making the, the sulfuric acid out there. And so, well, there are a couple of possibilities. We could, if we wanted to, we could feed in a supply of barrels of sulfuric acid and then have the barrels come back or the steel come back that would be possible we could we could we, we, we could indeed do that but it's a horrible horrible idea so we're not going to instead we're going to have well these two belts here are coming from these these belts over here which have sulfur and iron ingots on them so we're going to be pumping loads of these through and there are two possible ways to control how much is going through one is to have a signal transmitter at the other end that says over here in the other asteroid field we're going to need so many pieces of sulfur and so many iron ingots to keep everything satisfied, keep everything running. And in which case we then send the signal back through here to a signal receiver that will then be hooked up to these cables down here and will pass through everything and will then tell the uh, belts to turn on and off and pass through the stuff that's actually required. That could work. The other possibility is to monitor the amount of stuff that's actually in this Arcolink chest and try and keep all of these at I don't know, 50% of a stack. So we'll we'll try and load these up to um to being to the point where they are where there's at least a bit of iron and a bit of sulfur in here all the time, and then we'll let this flow whenever there's a shortage of either of those. Then at the other end, we would hmm, then we'd have to set filters on the other end, and that wouldn't really work. Because then at the other end, we would either have to use a uh, filter inserter to pass the stuff out into some sort of chest or warehouse to say how much to make sure that we were filtering and only taking stuff out at the other end when it was needed, or we'd have to use multiple loaders to unload everything. We don't want to use multiple loaders because the more loaders you use to to take the uh, the resources out to make the to make the acid, the fewer available spaces you've got around the edge of your Arcolink chest in order to put in the actual naquitite that is the whole point of this system. So I think we want to make sure this is only a single thing being fed in. So yes, I think we'll probably use the signal transmitter method. However, we could alternatively use the use a filter inserter on the other end to just take out the stuff that's wanted. Either of those methods would work, and I haven't yet decided which one's better. I think probably the signal transmitter is, is a slightly cleaner system, especially given I've got this all this all the way down here. So when you start passing iron ingots through, you're going to get a good couple of stacks going into this into this chest before you before it actually gets cut off again. So I think using a signal transmitter is probably going to be a better way to do it. But you know, we'll uh, we'll see what we feel like. And so we can feed both of those in from down here. With sulfur and the iron will go in and nice and happily. We'll go in up here and be passed through. We we have a choice with the water. So there are three ingredients for sulfuric acid. You need iron, you need sulfur, and you need water. Um, we can either mine water out in the other asteroid field, wherever that is, or we can bring it in from here. And I put in a system down here. These two chemical plants are going to take in cryonite and water and, and make cryonite slush and then, and then water ice and feed it out, feed it up here if, if, if it's required. Now, we haven't actually decided whether it's required yet, so we shall wait and see. Um, but I think we have we have a healthy supply of water over here, I, I hope. I'm not sure where it's actually coming from. Um, probably, oh, this lake over here, probably. So that's quite a long way. I may need to run some ducting over there. Or I could take the water that's being produced over here. That might be a, might be sensible. might be nice to just reuse it rather than blowing it off into, into space. And then we can feed that back up and feed the water ice through with exactly the same sort of system. And I don't expect the throughput to be particularly high on these. So I'm expecting one, uh, one belt here to be enough. And I can always upgrade these splitters and this belt to a purple one if it turns out we do need it to go through faster than it can at the 
them with, with, with just a blue belt. And so that's that's Naquitite processing. Uh, however, there is one there is one slight step note missing here. You might have noticed that we don't actually have any Naquium here. We just have some core mining drills because I put them in as a demonstration. And they're not particularly useful. And so I tasked Mike with going off and finding me some more Naquitite. And he had a look around some of the uh, various different uh, asteroid fields out here. And he eventually settled on Melancholia up here, right at the top. Uh, and this is a very, very long way from Kalidas, which is all the way down here. So we're not, we wouldn't be flying, flying the spaceships uh, straight across like that as we were before. We'd probably end up doing the Fenestra trick and to send them out via Fenestra and then back out to Melancholia that way. However, because we're going to be using Arca links, we don't need to have a steady stream of spaceships going back and forth. So we don't need to worry about that one. So over here in Melancholia, he's taken a look at it and he's decided that yes, this is going to be a suitable place. Uh, there's there's some, um, okay, he's flown his spaceship out here, and by the look of it, yes, he's, we, well, he's thought about setting up some mines. He's got a beam receiver in here that is gradually warming up, and that's going quite nicely. Out here, hopefully, we'll find some good, chonky, uh, Naquitite patches. Uh, that was rare metals, rare metals. There's, there's, there's 1.4 million there, 3.2 million over here, and another 1.7. Those are quite good, so that'll be an easy one. Drop in a train station there, bring it over, unload it over here, and we can put it into the, into the unloading system. There's another 3 million over there. And if I do a search of the surface, well, you can see we found a number of patches uh, varying varying sizes. Unfortunately, it hasn't sorted them. There's a nice 5.2 million here. Oh, that's the one that he's already uh, already put the mines down on. And another 1.1 million there. We can see some very small ones. There's a million, 1.4 million, 1.6, 1.8, 3.2, 2.6. There's a, there's a decent amount out here. And as, as we get as we uh, want more and more, we can we can scan further and further out and put more and more trains in. And it it's a it's a bit of a path building all that stuff up but it does allow you to get quite a lot of uh, nacrotite flowing in and if it's just being chucked straight into a into an arcolink chest it should be reasonably easy now obviously this isn't finished yet he's just he's done a little bit of a start but he's done the important bit which is putting down this energy beam receiver and the reason that's the important bit is because it takes a while to heat up especially when it's way out in the middle of nowhere like this one is you get a relatively small amount of the power that's put into the beam emitter actually arriving at the energy beam receiver so it heats up fairly slowly but this does mean that by the time he's got everything else ready, this will probably be ready to start giving him all of the energy he needs. And in order to get that up and running, well, he decided that Wexovis is actually reasonably close to Melancholia. Yes, it's closer to Melancholia than Stardust is to Kalidas, so that means he'd hopefully get a bit more power being pumped through from there. And if we take a look at Wexovis, we can take a look on the surface here. We see, yes, he has a beam receiver. It has a number of uh, energy beam injectors around the edge here. We are pumping in uh, 8 gigawatts plus plus the 1 gigawatt that the system itself uses. And we have a transmission efficiency of 13.5%. That's quite a bit better than the about roughly 3 or 4%, I think, that I was getting um, out to Stardust because it was further away. So this is this system has worked quite well. And this is clearly much, much better than having a, an energy beam transmitter over in Kalidas would have been. It would have taken phenomenal amounts of power and basically no, almost none of it would have got out here. There are other alternatives to powering, of course. We could we could have had a spaceship coming out with a with a with a beam receiver on it that's been heated up beforehand, but it's an awfully long flight for a spaceship, so that wouldn't really be suitable. Uh, we could pass some sort of, we could pass power out, out there, we could have some sort of um, reactors out there, maybe use the matter reactors again, but, the, but, that's, but these are all things that require actual infrastructure, they require you to send stuff out. Whereas this just requires you to build an enormous quantity of solar, and uh, then you can pump it, and then you can pump a beam out and send it out to the, uh, to the system that way. And so Mike has, Mike has done so. As you can see over here, we have uh, quite a lot of solar. Uh, there was a request in, in chat, or in, in one of the messages on a previous video, to make slightly more aesthetic uh, solar builds. So uh, so Mike has done that here, as you can see. It, it, yes, it looks, looks very nice. We've got a little defense area up here. We've got all these little patches of solar around here, be, uh, producing lots and lots of juicy, juicy energy to keep everything running. And this is quite a lot bigger than it actually has to be for the transmitter here. As I said, we're using 9 gigawatts here. And Mike has put down, so far, he's put down 46 gigawatts, of which we're using 9.1. And this is because, well, this is another star system. And so eventually, at some point, we're going to want to put in a dimensional anchor. And they use about... 60 gigawatts, I think, off the top of my head. So as you can see, there's quite a lot out here that's being specced up for future expansion, and we would like to eventually get enough uh, enough uh, solar deployed out here that we can drop in our dimensional anchor. Has he left a space for it? No, he's obviously going to put it in the middle of another set, another area of um, another solar array or something like that. I, I don't know exactly what he's got planned for that, but yes, there will eventually be a dimensional anchor in here that will be doing a very that will be doing a, the same job as the one in around Kalidas and providing an extra blip for the uh, for the for the Stargate. You will notice, however, that Mike's plans to build out massive quantities of solars, solar have been somewhat scuppered by a shortage of, um, of, of scaffolding. So he's got 
he's got a lot of it built, as, as we saw before. He's got 46 gigawatts coming out here, but he still needs more. He needs the full 60, I believe. Or no, he needs, he's going to need 70 because of the 10 being taken by the, uh, by the beam emitter. And so he's got all this area out here blueprinted up, but it seems he's run out of scaffolding. And scaffolding shortages have been a bit of a running theme in the last stream. And so several of us have been stealing little bits of um, scaffolding from areas like like up here, for example. We put, you see, this was probably filled up completely solidly. This was certainly filled up solid before with uh, with the uh, with the scaffolding. And we've pulled up, and then a load has been pulled up from over here where we where we weren't just weren't really using this area very much. Uh, we still have some belts that are clinging on for dear life. Uh, and then now they're doing the weird undergroundy things I don't really like. So I'm going to blame Mike for that. Um, there's still quite a bit that we could steal, but it's getting to the point where it's starting to get a little bit silly. We're just sneaking, sneaking, trimming off tiny little bits from around the edges of almost everything, just in a desperate attempt to get a little bit more space scaffolding through, because all of these solar fields require enormous amounts of scaffolding. So make, making these ones, make, putting down one solar panel requires 16 pieces of scaffolding to go underneath it. Then it requires a solar panel as well, which isn't exactly cheap, and so on and so on. And so to an extent, you can you, you can sort of compensate by using more expensive solar panels, for the, but then then the whole build just gets much, much more expensive. And the reason this is problematic is, well, we are we are building um, scaffolding. You can see over here we have all of these machines here chugging away merrily. They're building building space scaffolding, putting it into these warehouse into these red chests along here, and the bots coming over, taking it away, bringing it over to the spaceships. But we're not able to build up any sort of buffer because we have such a high demand for it. And part of the reason that we have a high demand is because, well, because we ran out, and we ran out because we uh, ran, we had a, com a complete shortage of low density structures. And at the moment, actually, it looks like the um, it's the heat, sh heat shielding that's the uh, the shortage along here, or at least that's the bit that's the um, that's causing the machine up at the top to not be able to build quite as fast as it would like to. But anyway, yes, there was a massive shortage of low density structures because we weren't bringing up enough of them up, and that was due to a horrendous shortage of them down on the ground over here. Well, how many have we got now? How are we doing? Actually, we've we've, we've caught up with low density structure production now. We've we've managed to fill this warehouse up and a large part of the reason we've managed to fill that up um, is because over here Mark has done some upgrades. So previously I'd put in all these machines along here and these were making low density structures at about, about a blue belt rate and that seemed to be pretty good. We're bringing in all the bits and pieces we needed, making the low density structures, they were being fed out. Uh, that, however, was not enough low density structures for, for the sudden, sudden requirements. Uh, so Mark has extended it up here. Is this a tripling? We've got eight machines there and we've got 12 machines there, so no, it's another 150, it's added on 150%, so we've got two and a half times as many low density structures being made when the system is all running. That of course required all these belts to be upgraded as well, that's, that's fine, oh, actually not, not only did it require the belts to be upgraded, it required more belts to be put in, so we've got a lot a lot more throughput here of all of the all the bits and pieces that are required, but this does mean that we're now able to make two and a half times as many uh, low density structures, although it's not, uh, it's the numbers are slightly funny because these are lower tier uh, productivity modules because we're struggling for high tier ones at the moment. But still, it is a massive improvement. We're making the low density structures enormously faster than before. As you can see, if we look back over the last 10 hours, well, we were, this, this was presumably the standard speed we were making that before. 2.6 thousand per minute, it's not bad. Uh, then Mark did his upgrade. We had a big spike up here. We made them a lot more quickly. And now it's, it's things have calmed down a little bit. Now we've caught up and they've got down to, uh, now we're still back at about, about 2.5 thousand per minute. What's a bit more serious is you'll notice back here that there was n there were none being made. Uh, that was my fault because I broke the uh, the cryonite trains. I think I talked about it in the last set of videos. Tristan has now fixed that. It was a fairly easy fix, but he got to it before me. So now we have the uh, the, the cryonite is being brought in nice at a nice steady rate when as and when we need it. And so those two things between them, fixing the cryonite and also bringing in uh, producing a lot more uh, a lot more low density structures a lot more quickly, has meant that we've now caught up over here. And that means that the bottleneck is now, I suppose, up here in space where we're just we Maybe we just don't have enough of these machines making them. Uh, they're all packed full of tier 6 speed modules, crikey. Um, no wonder this, that we're struggling to keep up. So maybe the next thing to do is going to be to run an upgrade planner through here and turn all of this into a deep space belt all the way up here. And then maybe have even more machines up here making even 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 more scaffolding. Just because we have such a, such a need for it. We need to, we probably just need to be making it faster and faster and faster and faster. Uh, the other possibility is just to upgrade these belts and then put in a speed beacon around here somewhere because I don't think these are beaconed. They are just being mod they're just moduled. So that would also speed stuff up quite a bit. Um, 
but yeah, either of those either of those things will, will give us a nice nice healthy increase in the amount of um, in the amount of space scaffolding we're able to build. Another thing that we do of course need to consider with this is how much beryllium we have. And now at the moment it seems to be absolutely fine. The station is uh, currently asking for a train, but it can it's allowed to do that. It, it has a decent amount in it. It's still got twelve thousand in it, and that's being fed out. All of this stuff seems to be all right. We see, we don't seem to have any problems with the beryllium at the moment, but that's something to keep an eye on. And in the next video I am going to check through all of the various different resources and see how everything's getting on. I think we're okay for beryllium, but it's always good to check. Oh look, a train's come in. So now we have, uh, well we're filling the train up, that means these two belts along here are flowing flat out, and that means all of our production systems along here have kicked back in again. So we are now producing the low density structures at the speed we, um, we, we now, at the speed we now can. And so if we have another look back at the graph, yeah, you can see that's spiking back up to about about 8,000. So it, when, it's, when it's actually running flat out, as I said, it's capable of running significantly faster than it was before. So we are making lots and lots of scaffolding. Unfortunately, well, a lot of that is coming over here. Okay, a lot of it's going into Mike's ship, which is fair enough. He's going to need it. I think he's just stockpiling it in here, and he's going to come back with the uh, the deep space exploration ship, which I believe is the one he's been using to go out to uh, Melancholia. And then he's going to grab all that, chuck it in his spaceship, and take it off away with him. So he's got forty-two thousand in there. That seems like a lot, but um, but he, then he does he does in fact need a lot. Because let's, 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 let's do the maths here quickly. One of these flat solar panel twos produces 12 megawatts when it's in, a, in orbit around a sun like this, which is pretty good. But because he needs 70 gigawatts, yeah, 70 gigawatts out here, that means he's going to need about 5,800, slightly over 5,800 of these solar panels in order to get that much power. And to put down all of those solar panels is going to require over 90,000, 93,000 and... And some change. So call it ninety-four thousand. Call it ninety-five thousand for a round number because he's going to need a little bit extra for other shenaniganery around here. I'm sure. So about ninety-five thousand of the, uh, of the of the scaffolding, and and Mark is going to need similar amounts for all of the uh, anchors he's trying to put in because Mark has also been building up one out in Asimus orbit. So over here. Well, actually, no, he has built... Sorry, this is the one he built last time. He's also trying to build up enough uh, scaffolding to go out and put in another one of these systems. And so each one of these... If, if each one of these is going to require somewhere in the region of 80,000 um, uh, pieces of space scaffolding, and we're currently producing about 1,500 per minute, that means it's going to take about an hour at the current rate of production to produce enough scaffolding to do to deploy one, one of these anchors. Um, and each one of our hours, because we're running at about 30 at UPS, each one of our hours actually lasts two hours. So in an entire stream, if we dedicated all of the um, all of the production, all the production of scaffolding to just going out to put in these anchors, we'd maybe be able to do two at best. Interesting, look, looking back at all time, in the entire game, in the ent entire playthrough, we've made 2.3 million scaffold. So that would be enough to put down 24 of these dimensional anchors with all of the power they require if we did literally nothing else. <laughs> and we require eight of them, I think, for the Stargate. So putting down our dimensional anchors would require a third of all of the scaffolding we've built in our entire game. That's kind of horrific, but at least it's at least it's a third of the amount we've produced in the entire game. It's not telling us we're going to need to produce three times the amount we've already produced or something ridiculous like that. So it's not going it's not going quite as exponential as it might have, but that's still that's still an awful lot. So you can see why people have been sort of starting to try and steal little bits from around the edges. I mean, it's not really a long-term solution. It's sort of like you're, you're, you're selling off the family jewels to pay for something and once you've done that, you haven't got them anymore so you can't do it again next time you need it. So it is not ideal, but I suppose it, it helps a little bit for some of the smaller stuff we're trying to do. Mike did the maths for this and apparently this is over 23 chests worth of scaffolding in order to build the whole thing. So all these numbers, they're all ridiculous. <laughs> And part of the reason that Mike has been struggling so much to get hold of enough scaffolding is because Mark has been doing exactly the same as well. He's come out to Calmea, uh, Calmea, Calmea, something like that, uh, and he's put in another one of these massive, massive builds where he's got a huge, huge area of solar that is producing 60, 62 gigawatts, but more or less, of which 60 gigawatts is going straight into this dimensional anchor here, and the rest is available for these defensive cannons. Um, so that has, been, that has been where a lot of our uh, scaffolding has gone over the last couple of streams, and also where all of these solar panels have been going. But that does mean, if we took a, take a look over here at Fenestra, at the Stargate, and we turn on the switch over here and use all of the power, give it a moment to boot up, we will hopefully see we've got now got a few more of the anchors lighting up over here like that. There we go. So you can see we've now got to three three anchor lights on, so that's one in Kalidus, one in Asimius, and one that I was just showing you in Calmea. And so once Mike finishes his one over in Wexovis, we'll actually be halfway there on the on the anchors. 
that's quite good. We are making good progress there, which I mean, I guess means we need to start thinking a little bit more about what symbols we want to put into the Stargate once we get there. And to that end, Tristan has been off exploring pyramids once again. He's been to Akisrind, Penium, Theseus, Jiangyin and Regis, where he's picked up two efficiency modules, two productivity modules, and a speed module. So, and, oh, and some, and taken pictures of all of the uh, all the glyphs and uh, cartouches there, of course, as well. I've not done any more thinking about that though, so I don't have any more any, anything else to report about the puzzle apart from well, we are still making progress, we are still going to the pyramids, and still guessing basically. That's as, that's as far as we've got. <laughs> And I think having been, well, I've been recording for almost 50 minutes, although quite a bit of that time was spent with me hopping around looking at things and trying to work out what I was going to talk about next. <clears throat> uh, there's, there's, there's a behind the scenes for you. Uh, so I think that's probably about enough for this video. Uh, thank you very much for watching. I'll be back to with some more video content tomorrow where I'll talk about the rest of the stuff that's been going on in the, uh, in the last stream because there was quite a bit of it. So make sure you subscribe so you don't miss out on that. And I hope I'll see you then. We will, of course, be back on Monday to carry on with the uh, K2SE stream and uh, fixing up all the things we've been looking at today and trying to just desperately trying to make more uh, scaffolding by the looks of it um, <laughs> and maybe a bit more naquium as well. Uh, I shall also be back on Wednesday for some more satisfactory where I'm continuing to work on things that aren't technically um, science packs but they kind of are really so there'll be lots of that going on so make sure you subscribe so you don't miss out on the streams and all the various videos that are coming out. Thank you very much for watching and I shall see you next time. Bye bye. <laughs>